believed that what set him apart from animals was culture. What they knew was innate, what we knew was acquired. Nature versus culture. But scientists now realize that some animals are so inventive that their species must be blessed with cultures of their own. So are the origins of culture not to be found in the animal kingdom after all? The monkey teacher is running a new kind of school in Munich. With the beginning of the new school year, pupils would be advised not to make fun of those who are aping them, with the excuse that they are in fact real monkeys. How we love to laugh at animals behaving like us. A classroom full of chimpanzees appears so incongruous, a contradiction in terms. But would we laugh so much if we discovered that animals really are quite cultivated and that the chimps get the last laugh? For centuries, culture was the last barrier that separated man from animals. To be cultured meant to be human. But over the past 50 years, researchers observing a group of macaques in Japan shattered this notion. Every winter, the hot springs in the mountains around Nagano in central Japan attract some unlikely visitors. Here, the forest of Jikokudani literally means Hell's Valley, but it's the closest thing to heaven for these Japanese macaques. The artificial pools are extremely popular with other local species. The snow monkeys took their first dip in these artificial pools in the 1950s, and it changed their way of life forever. Several times a day, they relax, play, and groom themselves in the hot volcanic waters. Heat from the springs protects the monkeys from the cold and helps dry their coat quickly. Only Japanese and a group of Indonesian macaques behave this way. It's not genetically inherited behavior, but something they learned during the course of their lives. For Franz de Waal, one of the world's leading primatologists, this is a defining cultural moment for both animal and man. Uh, we speak of culture when groups of animals in similar environments of the same species behave differently. And they behave differently as a result of social learning, of learning from each other. If animals can now be said to be cultivated, they owe their hard-earned culture to Japanese macaques. The first human observations of animal culture took place around the same time, not in Nagano, but on the tiny island of Koshima, off the southeastern coast of Japan. A group of researchers placed sweet potatoes in the sand and soon macaques began washing them in the sea before eating them. A young female called Emo started the whole thing. Others in her group soon followed. So the monkeys obviously preferred clean potatoes with a pinch of salt to sandy ones. But as Franz de Waal explains, their behavior set in motion the whole concept of animal culture in primatology. And I think it's very interesting that the idea came from Japan and not from the West. Because in the West, we have a habit of putting a big wall between humans and animals, and culture became part of that wall. The anthropologists would say, culture is what makes us human, meaning that obviously then animals cannot have culture. And in the East, the borderline between human and animal is not as clear. 
The culinary discoveries of the macaques on Koshima raised serious doubts about the time-honored prejudice that animal behavior was mainly the product of genetic inheritance. Other evidence soon weighed into the debate. In a valley beyond the potato washers, another troop of macaques displays a different sort of talent. The macaques of Arashiyama enjoy rubbing stones together. Seen for the first time in a female only 27 years ago, and again the activity is copied by other members of the troop. Today, nearly all the monkeys in this forest play the same game, adults and young alike. So what do they get out of it? It seems little or nothing in the short term, but scientists now believe that over the long run, there may be important benefits for both the young and aged, something like training or mental exercise to keep the brain active. Culture does not necessarily imply some kind of immediate reward, as long as it's fun. Maybe they just enjoy the sound of the stones. More rock and roll than we imagined. When we think animal culture, we shouldn't paint an image of our own artistic sense. We could be tempted to imagine music-loving monkeys or budding Picassos of the jungle, but that's looking at animal culture through our eyes and not theirs. The natural world is full of examples of culture in animals, and where better to go next than Africa? Chimpanzees are among the most evolved of all primates. They're our closest cousins in the wild, and the more scientists study their behavior, the more the truth about them sinks in. They champion animal culture like no other creature on Earth. Some groups observe dozens of different traditions. Take their hunting techniques in the Mahali National Park in Tanzania. The chimps here eat meat, and their favorite prey is the red colobus monkey that chooses to live high in the canopy for protection. <laughs> to catch one, the chimps must join forces. Strategies and tactics vary depending on how thick the forest is. In Mahali, trees aren't particularly high, and the low density of the woodlands limits the possible escape routes for the prey. So it may take only a single chimp to climb after the colobus, while the others follow below on the ground. In Tai National Park, chimpanzees as a rule hunt in groups, and in most cases, collaborate while hunting, because the canopy level is up to 200 feet, and colobus have more time to avoid the approaching chimpanzees. When the hunt is over, the male chimps eat the colobus in the trees, but also share a bit with the females and their young. Chimpanzees are the only great apes that hunt like us. Anthropologists believe man's ability to hunt in groups determined the course of human evolution. Our ancestors hunted together and shared the spoils with others when resources were scarce. The chimps of Mahali show off other more complex skills. They eat ants all year round, but must use a little ingenuity to do so. First, they locate the right tree. Then they fashion a twig into a tool to get at the ants. This takes thought. 
at least enough to show it's not just instinct or innate behavior. They know exactly what to do with it. They visualize the act of catching ants and mentally anticipate what will happen next. Most chimpanzees will fish for ants or termites on the ground, but Mahali chimps are one of the few that fish for carpenter ants in trees. The Mahali chimps also groom themselves in a most unusual way. Scientists describe it as hand clasp grooming. The chimps face each other with one arm outstretched, clasping the hand of the other. They groom each other's armpits with their free hand. This hygienic habit is practiced by both adults and young. But chimps in the Gombe National Park, only a hundred miles away, don't do this. Hand clasping in Mahali is a social custom which evolves slowly over time. One member of a group discovers something new and the others pick it up, a wide range of customs that differ from group to group and region to region in the land of the apes. Chimps have rare abilities. A study by a group of primatologists in the year 2000 recorded no less than 65 different types of cultural behavior unknown to neighboring groups. Today we face a paradox because chimps are more culturally diverse than earliest man. So who's the star? Him, of course. After observing the range of behavior in apes, scientists ask themselves the big question. If culture is not unique to man, could its origin be found in animals? In other words, is culture natural? When the rains come to Mahali, chimpanzees weaken and become sick with parasites. but they found a remedy. These great apes swallow volumes of rough leaves from a number of different plants. The unchewed leaves are difficult to digest, are a burden to the stomach, and are rapidly passed through the digestive system, purging them of the worms. Professor Michael Huffman, a primatologist at the University of Kyoto in Japan, has studied this purging behavior firsthand. Among socially living animals, individuals learn what plants in their environment are okay to ingest by watching their elders. This information is based on the group's accumulative experience and knowledge of the habitat and is passed on from one generation to the next. Humans have long looked to the habits of sick animals for novel pharmacologically active plants for the treatment of common ecologically relevant ailments. It should be no surprise then that in some instances, humans and animals living in the same environments sometimes use the same plants to treat the symptoms of similar diseases. Professor Huffman noticed that local people in the park use the same medicinal plants as the chimps. Traditional medicine are in some very fundamental ways the product of our shared evolutionary past with the rest of the animal kingdom. The thread that links man to the animal world extends even into the realm of culture. The wet season in Mahali excites the chimpanzees. They charge around, screaming their heads off and shaking the trees. Scientists have described the ritual as a rain dance. Are they paying homage to the elements? Are we looking at how religion all began? The question is hotly debated among scientists. For Jane Goodall, the respected primatologist who spent a lifetime defending chimpanzees, such behavior proves their fascination with nature and all its mysteries. The rain dance evokes a kind of transcendence, something beyond the physical world. 
Culture forms part of the natural world. But which animal can teach us how to behave? You could be forgiven for ruling out baboons. They're aggressive and violent. Males fight over food and females. You could hardly imagine them living peacefully together, and yet that's precisely what some tribes do. Has peace really broken out? This tribe in Kenya's Masai Mara suffered a massive blow in the early 1980s when every dominant male died from food poisoning. Without the big bullies, violent tribal incidents dropped dramatically and it stayed that way. The macho model was replaced by an oasis of peace and tolerance. Scientists aren't exactly sure how the new social model developed. But the females, who stay in the group while males migrate elsewhere, are certainly responsible. By encouraging intimacy with new members of the tribe and grooming males to keep them quiet, the females succeeded in keeping the peace. These baboons show how since time immemorial, seemingly ordinary behavior in the wild can be a product of culture. Nothing forces violent primates to stay that way, and that goes for us too. But who's to say cultural behavior ends with primates? If spiders, snakes or cattle don't make the grade along with most animals that are ruled by their instincts, some creatures do qualify. They're the ones that are capable of learning in groups over a long life. One of the most established cultures in the natural world is the mating songs of humpback whales. Males spend hours, sometimes days, vocalizing across breeding grounds in wide tonal ranges and frequencies. A typical love song lasts 10 minutes or more and is repeated over and over again. Scientists believe they're the most complex sounds heard in the natural world. Whale songs differ from ocean to ocean. But two males, thousands of miles apart in the same ocean, like one from Hawaii and another from the Pacific coast of Mexico, can sing exactly the same tune. And both tunes will evolve from year to year in the same way. If the way whales transmit their songs remains a mystery, the ocean depths do seem to help sound waves travel across vast distances. The spread of their culture, synchronized across vast areas and through dispersed humpback populations, is matched only by man. Music circling the globe like a wind crossing continents. Other feathered prima donnas offer further key insights into what it takes for a culture to emerge from the animal kingdom. Crows in the archipelago of New Caledonia in the South Pacific have given a whole new dimension to the term bird brain. 
Naturally, for a small bird, their brains are tiny compared to mammals. But scientists have no hesitation in comparing the intellect of a crow to that of a great ape. Crows choose twigs according to their size and shape. They then put the tool to good use. The caterpillar stands no chance against the crow's technical expertise in using a carefully chosen tool for a deliberate purpose. It shows great dexterity with its beak. But its ability to invent a tool is not genetically programmed. It isn't an innate skill. Not all crows are so gifted. Even though their technical skills are handed down to future generations, their behavior depends on what kind of materials and prey are available in any given place. Conditions in the Austrian forests around Salzburg could not be more different than those of New Caledonia. Thomas Bugniar, a biologist at the Konrad Lorenz Research Station, studies the cognitive abilities of ravens here. Ravens seem to have a quite complicated or sophisticated lifestyle. They sometimes cooperate with others, non-related individuals, and sometimes they fiercely compete with others. And those two factors obviously have a quite strong input on their cognitive abilities. Finding food in the Austrian winter is always a challenge. Ravens stash their provisions in caches, secret larders where use-by dates are strictly observed. The ravens appear to understand something about time and space as they stock and hide their provisions. The cash system of survival demands imagination and a strong sense of perspective, qualities normally associated only with great apes. They hide their booty in the snow. Ravens also spy on each other to plunder when the time is right. Their behavior suggests they understand another's point of view and can act accordingly. They make sure the coast is clear before burying their food. Ravens under study in Austria are clearly animals of high intelligence, just what's needed for culture to blossom. To put them to the test, the team of scientists invented a problem. Food is tied to the end of a piece of string. The string, in turn, is attached to a branch. The ravens must work out how to get the food. They understand how to use one object, string, to get another, food.
Solving this problem means they can make a mental image of how one thing interacts with another in space. Raymond possess quite sophisticated cognitive skills, in the, particularly in the direction that they can obviously um, understand something about the other's perspective. We also know that they are very good social learners, so obviously they meet the requirement for socially or culturally transmitting information. Corvids, the family of birds that includes ravens, crows and magpies, adapt their diet to where they live. This flexibility works well in a consumer society. The botanical gardens in Paris attract several dozen crows because it's a good place for a free picnic. They stake out the best spots to keep an eye on activity below. So what's in it for a hungry crow? Just a few leftovers? It's hardly worth the effort and there's so much competition. These crows are after much bigger fare, a whole bag of French fries. They're champions of fast food scavenging and they know exactly what to look for. A recognizable brand. Given the choice of an anonymous bag of fries and a colorful brand name, they'll take the latter. Their usually open-minded attitude towards food has become one-track-minded, just like the junk food addicts sitting on park benches. The tricks of good scavenging are handed down to the next generation. Young crows learn to spot a good meal by its wrapper. But that's not the end of the story. The crows of Paris's botanical garden have developed a strong liking for self-service. They want for nothing, an abundance of choice in any number of plastic garbage bags around the park, and they're very picky. Crows are heavily influenced by human culture, especially the junk food culture which has even spread to the gourmet capital of the world. What bird brain ideas will these crows come up with next? One thing is for sure, they make full use of the grey matter inside. Grey matter is something crows have in common with dolphins. Their high intellect makes them behave in quite different ways from group to group. They don't all play ball. This match is in California and brings something new to basketball. When dolphins have the ball, they score every time. You can't make out the teams because none of them are wearing uniforms. In an ever-changing environment, it takes time to develop new survival skills. The emphasis must be on passing on the skills as quickly as possible before those who know die with the secrets. But some secrets could be deadly to pass on. At the Texan oil terminal of Galveston, bottlenose dolphins have refined a particularly risky technique for traveling fast without effort. These bow wave acrobats hitch a ride with a 300,000 ton tanker. It's probably fun, but one slip and a young apprentice could die. Unlike racing in someone else's slipstream, these dolphins ride in front. Every leap in the air reduces friction and saves time. There's no room for error. 
Dolphins take full advantage of their environment, particularly one that's changed by man. Joining the oil rush to get ahead is par for the course. Dolphins inhabit every ocean and sea on the planet. Little wonder they're constantly reinventing the art of survival. When it comes to hunting, every group has its own technique. Bottlenose dolphins in the shallow coastal waters of Florida rely on a high degree of organization to hunt. They chase schools of fish to the surface and knock them flat with their tails. The key is to coordinate the attack so enough fish are parked near the surface to be neutralized. A few hundred miles to the north, the same species takes a completely different, though no less unorthodox, approach. In the waterways of South Carolina, bottlenose dolphins practice beach feeding. They join forces to round up mullets and chase them to the bank. It's a somewhat messy picnic, but it's effective as long as the dolphins give chase together. The low tide helps as the dolphins repeat the process again and again. Mysteriously, they always beach on their right side. The dolphins have inhabited these waters for a long time. The knack doesn't come overnight. Far to the south, in the Gulf of Mexico, the same species hunts by sonar. Their prey is less in evidence even in the clear, warm waters. Razorfish hide in the sandy bottom, so the dolphins use a system of echolocation to find them. They emit ultrasonic clicks amplified by pockets of fat under their brow. The sound waves bounce off objects and echo back. The dolphin's brain forms an image of the data and snuffs the prey out. Animals as intelligent and social as dolphins make full use of their skills by passing them on quickly to the next in line. Later generations refine the techniques for their own good, and so on down the line. Like humans, animals learn through contact with their own kind. But just how do they learn, and how similar is the process to ours? Young elephants take a long time reaching maturity. The role of their parents is crucial. The young spend years under the protection of adults in stable, organized groups. They're bound to be heavily influenced by their peers. Elephants belong to a group of animals defined by scientists as having multiple culture. They learn from each other and every successive generation improves on the knowledge acquired.
Learning what to eat and what not is a question of survival. The young only eat what their parents choose. So the mother instills likes and dislikes in her offspring. They memorize the best places to find food during shortages and the routes to take during migration. The matriarchs show the clan where to locate rare clearings rich in salt. This clan returns every year to the same salt grounds in Kenya's Abadea National Park. Because they're so large, elephants have difficulty getting enough salt from their daily diet. Salt deficiencies in all mammals can lead to dehydration and sickness, even death. So these elephants find what they need in the ground. Learning how to bend to scratch the soil isn't easy. The tradition of harvesting salt this way will be passed on so future generations have a better chance of survival. Animals are capable of great inventiveness and their offspring pick this up through apprenticeship and not through genetic inheritance. But do they depend on learning as much as we do? Fraulein Monica Peterback from Munich takes wonderful care of her adoptive son Cooney from Latin America. With such meticulous pampering, no wonder our little fellow has forgotten the laws of his native jungle and behaves in such a civilized fashion. An orphanage for bonobo apes on the outskirts of Kinshasa, capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo, shows just how dependent they are on their mothers. Here, young bonobos have been rescued from poachers. The species is threatened and only survives in a few primary forests in the region. Like chimpanzees, they're our closest relative in the wild, sharing almost 99% of our genes. Bonobos are born into a matrilineal society where maternal ties are paramount. The young grow up slowly. Even after a year, they barely know how to walk, let alone climb trees. As orphans, they're totally dependent on their surrogate human mothers. To survive on their own, they must be taught their own culture. Before being returned to the wild, they must learn how to feed themselves or they'll die of hunger. Patiently, they're taught to recognize edible food and how to peel it. Climbing skills are developed so that at night they'll be able to seek protection in the trees. Great apes make great pupils. As they understand the intentions of their fellow creatures, they're able to copy their behavior. Professor Tetsuro Matsuzawa has studied their nutcracking abilities at the Primate Research Institute of Kyoto University. It's a little delicate and complex skills for the chimpanzees. 
So we are interested in how the skill and knowledge can be transmitted from one generation to the next. I think a sort of education by master apprenticeship is very important. The mother or adults of the community show the right model using stones properly to crack open nuts. The infant has a strong motivation, intrinsic motivation, to watch the adult's behavior and to make the copy of the behavior. The mother and the adults are very tolerant to the infant. Any kind of spontaneous attempt by infant, infants are allowed to steal the kernel edible part from the mother. So everything, as far as the infants want to do, that is allowed. Animals with such a strong gift for innovation and apprenticeship will certainly influence each other if they live together. What a feat it is making a killer whale play ball. This ferocious toothed whale is the only carnivorous cetacean and is extremely voracious, but it doesn't scare its tamer in the slightest. Mammals leap to new cultural heights at the Marineland Attraction Park in the south of France. Here, orcas, or killer whales as they're more commonly known, learn directly from their human handlers. Their talent, among other things for imitation, favors the development of a cultural know-how. Trainers communicate with the whales by getting them to reproduce simple gestures. It's a language of sorts. Because the whales are able to interpret abstract signs, the trainers can put them through their paces. Young whales in the team copy their mothers to earn a tasty reward at the end of the performance. Independent of their human handlers, the orcas develop their own showbiz culture. Rather less spectacular than acrobatics, they've also learned how to imbibe water and spit it out again. They've never been seen to do this in the wild. The downside is that performing orcas can never return to open sea. Turning somersaults and other tricks is their way of earning food. Keiko, otherwise known as Free Willy in the films, died after he was retired back into the wild. These killer whales also get easily bored out of the limelight once they're used to it. The species holds one last surprise. Up until now, we've seen the art of good apprenticeship is down to the student. A good student is a good copycat. But how far can one animal actively teach another?
At the southern end of the Indian Ocean lies a group of windy islands called the Crozets. Here, adult killer whales teach the young how to survive. The classroom covers social behavior, hunting techniques, and even language skills. Adults spend long years teaching these skills. Every group can be identified by its calls. Vocalizations amount to a specific dialect, so members can communicate within a group. These whales are one of the great cold water predators. Of all the mammals, they hunt the widest range of prey, fish, penguins, birds, and even elephant seals. But the Crozet Islands are at the bottom of the world where giant carnivores struggle to fill their bellies. Killer whales must use their imagination to survive. French marine ecologist Christophe Guinet has studied how adults submit the young to a steep and dangerous learning curve when it comes to hunting skills. These orcas have refined a hunting technique which is quite special. And it's designed to size young elephant seals when they're close to the shoreline. Normally speaking, they're out of reach for orcas because they're still on land. What strikes us is the complete naivety of these seals. They seem oblivious to the dangers that the orcas represent. They move about the edge without ever associating it with risk. The first challenge for the predator is to locate a young elephant seal by listening to movements on the shore. killer whale then takes up position roughly 50 feet offshore, right opposite the target, and waits. burst of speed, it heads straight for the seal and the beach, while other whales lie in ambush. What's important in learning this technique? Obviously, there's a risk associated with this form of hunting. The risk is to stay beached, to go too high and not be able to return to the sea. Orcas around the Crozet Islands die doing this, and it's always the young. To minimize the risk, females teach their young to beach voluntarily. They push them to shore so they have a chance of learning how to get back. But the females must make sure that young apprentices don't get too close to the beach and die. They arch their bodies to spring back into deeper waters. The technique of intentional stranding takes up to seven years for a killer whale to perfect. Everything we've seen here in the Crozet Islands over several years clearly shows this behavior to be something which is transmitted through apprenticeship. It's not just done through imitation, but it's an active apprenticeship which will give the younger members of the group the skills to be able to hunt with this technique. The case for animal culture couldn't be clearer. Adult whales fully understand what they teach their young and why. The young in turn will transmit these skills to the next generation. Killer whales put the final nail in the coffin of human cultural monopoly.
So who's celebrating? 